Good morning, everyone. Uh, and I guess good evening to our guest today, who is quite a bit ahead of us, time zone wise. Um, welcome to another session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Joe Gorowski. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing the science, adventure, and conservation into classrooms uh, across North America and beyond. Um, so we have a couple classes joining us live today from New Jersey and from Texas. We do have a few more scheduled, so hopefully they'll pop in um, as the Hangout gets going. But uh, I have to welcome our guest today. I'm so excited to welcome uh, Asha DeVos. She's a marine biologist and ocean educator. Um, her project, the Sri Lankan Blue Whale Project, is the first long-term study of blue whales uh, in the northern Indian Ocean. And uh, she actually has the distinction of being the first and only Sri Lankan with a PhD uh, in marine mammals. So other neat things she gets to do, she's a TED Senior Fellow. She guest blogs for the National Geographic. Um, and we're going to talk about um, the whales that she does study. And this population, she calls them the unorthodox whales because after watching them for so long, she just, something about them just simply makes them different. So hopefully she'll share a little bit uh, of that with us today. Uh, Asha, how are you? I'm great. I'm very excited to be here. Very good. Well, we have, just watching, we have a couple viewers who are starting to pop online. So um, for those who are joining us, watching the live feed, um, on the event page, feel free to submit some questions. Let us know who you are and submit some questions and we'll try and take some of those as well as class, uh, questions from classrooms. Um, but I'm gonna let you take over because I know you've got all the good stuff today. I know you have a little presentation for us. Yep, I do. So I'm gonna screen share and hopefully everybody can see what I'm gonna put out there. Okay, here we go. Um, can you see that? Thanks. Okay. Here we are. Okay, everybody ready? Yep, we're ready. We just had another All client right. join us. So oh, perfect. They came in just in time for the presentation to start. Just in time. So I actually wanted to start with this picture because I really wanted all of you out there to know that my dream to become an adventurous scientist and a marine scientist started when I was about your age. So that's me right there on the right-hand side with the two little pigtails, and that's my brother, and that's us pretending to be sailors. So this was a long time. I was six years old. Um, I think you guys are probably older than that. Is that right? Yeah, we do. We we range from grade three to grade eight today. So okay. all the way from around eight to thirteen today. Okay, perfect. So so just so you know, you know, it, it's a long dream that I've had, and I follow a lot of different paths, and I got I am here today because I've sort of been very persistent with my dream and held on to it very tight. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit, tell you a little bit today about the kind of work that I do um, specifically with this incredible population of blue whales. And um, I'm just going to give you a short presentation just to give you a sense of what I'm doing right now, um, a little bit about the science, a bit about the adventure, a bit about how it all began. And uh, at the end, I'm really excited to, you know, sort of hear from you guys and what questions you might have. So. Um, so this is one of the beauties that I get to work with. Uh, it's a blue whale in Sri Lankan waters. Um, this is a northern Indian Ocean blue whale. And uh, it is, like, um, just as Joe said, I call these the unorthodox whales because they are, you know, they basically taught me that um, we build stereotypes for species or animals. We think they're supposed to do something. And then we talk about it as if that's, sort of a, the rules, but there are, sometimes if we dig deeper, we'll find out that these stereotypes can be broken. So when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I was taught that um, large whales, like blue whales, do these incredible long-range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas, right? So that's where they went to have their babies in nice warm tropical waters like Sri Lanka. And then they would go and feed somewhere like the Antarctic, for example. So that's that's sort of that's what I thought for the longest time. But subsequently, as I'm gonna share a little bit right now, like I started to soon realize about 13 years ago that it's actually not 
the case with this incredible population of blue whales. So the other things that make them unorthodox is that they speak a different um, language to blue whales in other places. So there are blue whales out in um, along the Pacific, so along California. There are some blue whales that go into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and those are two different populations. They speak different languages to the blue whales in Sri Lanka, which I think is really neat because it's one huge ocean basin, but they still have evolved in ways to have their own little conversations, have their own little languages, and talk amongst themselves. So that's really, really neat. Also, these guys out here, they have some different behaviors, so they lift their tails up before a deep dive way more often than anywhere else in the world. And I think that's neat because I feel like all these adaptations are stuff that um, make them pretty special. And most importantly, these blue whales don't do long-range migrations between cold areas and warm areas. They actually just hang around in warm waters all year round, which to me makes a lot of sense because I come from this beautiful tropical island in Sri Lanka. It's warm all year round, and I, if I had the chance, I would stay here all year round. I love the warmth, and I love the tropics, and clearly these whales do too. So I think that makes them pretty unique. But my story really with this particular population of blue whales starts, oh, so first of all, I'll take you to a map just to give you a sense of where Sri Lanka is, where I'm sitting right now in relation to where all of you are, if you haven't had a chance to look at a map yet. So this is the world, as we all know it. Um, and there, right there in the red box is where Sri Lanka is. So Sri Lanka is that beautiful little teardrop-shaped island at off the southern tip of India. It's never been a part of India. Um, it's its own little country. Uh, it's, it's a very beautiful island destination with the tropical palm trees and beautiful sandy beaches and warm ocean water year-round. So I can go for a swim in my swimsuit any time of the year, um, and I'm not about to lose my toes because it's too cold. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and so here on the left, you'll see just a blow up of the whole island, uh, just to give you a sense of the shape. Uh, it's called the Pearl of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's shaped like a teardrop. Um, I think it's a pretty stunning place. So if you ever in your lifetime get to travel somewhere exotic and you want to choose somewhere beautiful with lots of beautiful people and amazing food, Sri Lanka should be on your life list. Um, so my story with these blue whales actually began back in 2003. So that's just a bit before some of you were born. And I actually was working on this whale research vessel that was going right around the world. And um, I got the opportunity to get onto it. It's a whole long story to, about how I got onto it. And, uh, but I'm not going to go into the deal right now for the sake of this story. But I was on it, and we were cruising along the southern coast of Sri Lanka. I'd never really seen whales in Sri Lankan waters. And um, as we came around uh, the southeast coast of the island, it was this amazing, beautiful, stunning day. It was The ocean was flat calm, just like you see in this picture. You can see there's hardly a ripple on the water. It's beautifully calm. Um, and in fact, it was so calm, it was extremely hot because it's calm because there's no wind, um, but it meant we could see for miles on end, and you can see, I can see out to the horizon, which is probably like 12 nautical miles away, and you can see far and wide. So um, um, the work we were doing was uh, specifically... Wow. Okay. Um, oh, I just have a that's okay. classroom that joined in. Just mute their okay. mic. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so it, it was this incredibly beautiful day. And the work we were doing on this whale research was actually super interesting. So what we were doing was we were following sperm whales. And um, some of you may know what a sperm whale looks like. It's the largest toothed whale. Um, it has a very square head, and that actually is its nose. So it actually has the biggest nose out of all animals in the world, which I think is super fascinating. It has teeth, but only on the bottom uh, on its bottom jaw. And so you have these big pods of sperm whales that travel in Sri Lankan waters. And so on this research vessel, we were going out and taking samples of their skin and their blubber and looking at all the pollutants in the oceans, basically trying to figure out what the pollutants were based on using these samples from their skin. So we would follow them by we had dropping an underwater micro, uh, microphone, which is called a hydrophone, into the ocean. And you can hear them, and you can track them, and find these big pods. And then we can go set to work with collecting these samples. So 
we were out there, and this is what we were basically doing. Um, but at, during daylight hours, we also had someone on deck looking out at sea, um, making sure that um, you know we were recording all the marine life that was out there because these these vessels are very rarely, it's very expensive to run a research expedition. So when you finally get out there, you sort of want to um, do collect as much data as you can about all the stuff that's going on. So it happened that I was on deck. And there I was, staring out to sea, looking for signs of life. And I saw this incredible sight. I saw this incredibly tall, lofty blow in the distance. And I thought to myself, well, you know, What's really interesting about the blow of a whale is that you can often tell the difference between different species because, for example, a sperm whale only has one blowhole on its, the left side of its head. So when it exhales, the exhalation of the blow is very slanted off to the left-hand side. Um, there are other species like right whales, for example, that have what we would consider a heart-shaped blow or a V-shaped blow. Um, but this was just this singular pillar, and it was a column that was extremely tall, and it could be seen from, from quite far away. And I saw this, and I called out to the captain, and I said, I, I said, Bob, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a sperm whale. Well. Um, I don't know. We should go find out. And he was like, okay. So we start moving towards this area. And as we start cruising forward, I started to realize that there's not just one of these guys. There's about six blue whales in an area the size of a soccer pitch. Um, so when I say the six blue whales, each blue whale is about the length of a basketball court. So you're dealing with six of these giant animals in a very, very small area. And to me, I was like, why are they hanging out so close together? You know, they have this whole ocean. They can go, 70% of our planet is ocean, and they could go anywhere they want. And yet they're all aggregating and coming together in this small spot. So I thought about what I'd learned in university, and I remembered books saying that if they're in warm waters, they're usually breeding and calving. So they're either making babies or having babies. And I thought, well, maybe that's what they're doing. And so I tell Captain Bob, I'm like, let's keep going. Let's see what's happening. And as we got closer, I started to realize that it wasn't, that wasn't what they were having. There were no babies around, so they were clearly not having babies. There was no evidence of activity in that, that kind of activity. So I was pretty confused. You know, my textbooks had told me something, my books, and um, that's everything I knew about this species. But then I saw this. And some of you may know what this is. Some of you might be a little bit startled because it's bright red in color, it looks very bloody, but there's nothing to fear. This is actually a pile of whale poop. So I'm going to answer your question, because I know some of you are wondering, why is it red? Well, it's red because of what they eat. They eat these tiny shrimp-like creatures, and the oil in the body of the tiny shrimp-like creature gives their poop this beautiful bright red color. And I think it's the most stunning whale poop in the world or most stunning poop. And I always challenge my audiences, if you ever in your lifetime find poop that's more beautiful than this, you have to send me at least a photograph. It's extremely important because I just can't imagine there's anything more beautiful out there. And I know it sounds pretty yuck that someone can be excited about this, but there's good reason for it. Because when I found it, to me, I started to feel like Sherlock Holmes. I started to feel like an inspector. I was out there and there was this big clue in the form of this whale poop. Knowing that there was poop meant I knew that they were feeding somewhere close and that was extremely crucial because that broke all the rules. Like I said at the start, I was taught that large whales go to cold waters to feed. So cold waters like the Antarctic where the water can be maybe 4 degrees, 3 degrees Celsius. But here in Sri Lanka, our water is, particularly at the surface, it's about 28 degrees Celsius. It's extremely warm. Some parts of where you guys come from, the water may never get to those temperatures at any time of the year because it's actually pretty warm. So I was like, it was just a magnificent moment of realization because at that point I thought to myself, well, this population is doing something different. And I want to know what it is. Why is it that the, a population of the largest animal that has ever lived on this planet would choose to live in warm tropical waters where science 
up to now has told me they shouldn't be living because there's not enough food. Because normally cold water has a lot of food and warm water doesn't. So that's why these animals are generally doing these long range migrations, but they're not. And that's actually where my project began. That's where my curiosity for this incredible population of whales started. And I always tell people when I talk to them, the key element here is the importance of being curious. Now I could have seen this patch and I could have gone, well that's interesting, something weird's happening, and I could have gone on my way and missed a complete opportunity to kickstart my career. But instead I asked the questions, I got really excited, I started doing all the research I could, I started pulling all the books out that were on the board and trying to figure out why they were hanging around in these warm waters, like what was the advantage, how were they feeding there when they shouldn't be feeding there. And so that's, you know, if I hadn't been curious about that moment, who knows what I would have been doing with my life right now. But I'm glad to say that I was curious, even though it was a pile of poop. So the thing is, in these waters um, where I live, we have a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, here's a picture of a blue whale. That's its tail fluke, and it's going uh, on a dive. You can see those little things attached to its tail fluke. Some of you may be wondering what that is. Those are actually remoras. They are fish that stick to large animals and get free rides. Um, they don't actually harm the whales. They just get a free ride. and while they're traveling as the whale swims through the water, they filter the water and get the food that they need. So it's actually pretty energy efficient for these fish. I think remoras are extremely cool because they actually stick to these animals from the backs of their heads. So they're not actually sucking on from their mouths, they're actually stuck on by the backs of their heads, which means their mouths are still available for filtering the water and get extracting food, um, extracting oxygen and stuff like that. They're very cool animals. Um, on their own. Um, but here you have this picture of this whale diving and there's a big container ship in the background. And this is a very typical scene um, out in Sri Lanka where I work. Um, so I was really interested why this population was hanging around year round in these warm tropic waters. And I was most concerned about it because I knew what they were doing this in an area where there was a lot of ship traffic. So this, a site like this, not very uncommon at all. Um, so here I'm just showing you a map of uh, global shipping highways. And there's a lot of squiggly lines and a lot of noodles and it may seem a little bit daunting, but don't, don't worry. All I want you to do is look at the areas where you can see the yellow lines. Because the yellow lines show us where the busiest shipping highways are. So, you know, there are areas of the world where there's a lot of traffic um, for various reasons, and then there are some places where there's less traffic. But you can see these yellow lines are in just depicting where it's busiest. And if we focus in on the area that's in, of interest to us for the purposes of this talk, for example, around Sri Lanka, so you can see that area is highlighted in the white dotted circle. Um, you can see Sri Lanka, perhaps the tiny little gray dot of the southern tip of India, and you will see these yellow lines, very, very busy highways, traveling right off the south coast of the island. So Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan waters are home to some of the busiest highways in the world. And just to zoom in a little bit more, remember this map of Sri Lanka I showed you that at the start, you can see India there just off um, to the left of Sri Lanka. And what I've done with this map is I've basically taken data of where we've seen blue whales. So those are the black dots. You can see a clump of black dots at the bottom. There are some black dots further out. But you can see there's a huge clump off the south coast of Sri Lanka. And then you can see these red lines. So the red lines are actually real data from ship traffic. Um, we can collect this data either using satellites or we have these receiver towers that we have on land. Um, called And uh, we use this system called the um, AIS system, Automatic Identification System, which a lot of the very big ships, um, they, there's a law that says that they have to have one of these um, AIS devices on their boats and they have to transmit so that when um, they're going past land or the satellites can pick up their location. So we can track the ships in our oceans. It's very cool. It's very complicated technology, but it's really interesting that we can use this data. So what you have here is the shipping lanes, so real life shipping lanes, real life data about where whales are. I hope you can all see that off the southern coast of Sri Lanka, there's very busy shipping lanes, so the really red areas are where there's highest traffic, and that's overlapped with a big clump 
of blue whale sightings. So when you have whales and ships in exactly the same place, Hello. disaster is inevitable. So um, the next picture I'm going to show you, it's a little bit gruesome, but it is reality. This is, you know, there are a lot of things that happen in this world um, that are not so great to see, but it happens. So it's, it's important to talk about these things. So when you have whales and ships in exactly the same place, things like this are not uncommon. Here is a picture of a blue whale, one of these blue whales that I work with. Remember I showed you a picture right at the start, this beautiful, magnificent animal freely roaming the oceans. Here, much more of a sorry sight. This blue whale, you can see, has been was hit by the container ship and it came into the main harbor of Sri Lanka, that's in the city of Colombo, wrapped on the bow of a container ship. We know that it died on impact because it didn't have any big wounds or scars, but actually what we did see was, it was internal hemorrhaging. So it was actually bleeding out of the mouth, it was dead, the carcass was actually in pretty good condition. Okay. One way to say that um, they, it was hit on impact. Um, this is not only found in Sri Lanka, actually off uh, the coast of um, North America, both of the Californian coast and as you go along the east coast of the US and Canada, we, you, the ship strike is a problem out there for also species like right whales and humpback whales. So this is not a problem that happens only in Sri Lanka. It's actually the biggest problem that whales face all around the world. And it's something that we really have to address in order to save these populations. Now this is not a one-off sighting. Twelve days later we saw this carcass of a whale. It too had been killed. You can see this big gash in its body and that is also caused by a ship's propeller. So the most important here is, like I said, I was really interested in why these whales were hanging out all year round, where they were getting their food, and then I was like, why are they hanging out in an area which seems just terribly dangerous? It's like if you decided to hang out in the busiest highway in your town all year round. It doesn't make sense, but we soon discovered that the reason they're doing this is because that's where the food is. Their food is in these certain areas because of the way the ocean circulates um, and how that makes the food supplies sort of clump up in certain areas and the whales are attracted to the food. So it's like, that's kind of like their kitchen. And historically we've placed these shipping lanes without really understanding what the marine life is doing in these places. So now my quest actually is how do we stop these whales from getting killed by ships? Um, and like I said, we can't really move the whales out of the way because that's where their lunch room is. Um, but we can think about how we shift these ships out of the way from these areas so that, again, there's no overlap between the whales and the ships. And so that's the science that I'm working on right now. And in fact, we're just about finished with the science. We've sort of done, you know, this is what our science looks like. It looks really colorful. You can see a map of the world. The black dots are where um, blue whales have been seen around these areas, either using the data we have collected or historical data from other people who've gone out there, or even there was some whaling. So there was a time in, in the 60s where there were, the Russians would come and kill whales for oil and meat in this area and there was data on where they were doing that. So those are the black dots and the red areas are really telling us where we think there should be high concentrations of whales. So what we're doing with a map like this is we're then taking the ship routes because the shipping lanes are very defined around the world. Um, ships have to travel along certain highways. So that may have been a little bit more obvious in that picture of all those noodle lines that go, went through where I asked you to focus on the yellow lines. And so if we can look at where this overlap is happening, we can then try to think about how do we separate these two things from being in the same area. And the problem with shipping is it's not the ship company's fault. We're all sort of to blame because we all depend on shipping. 90% of everything in this world is shipped. If you look at yourself right now, maybe at least a couple of pieces of your clothing were made in another country and they came by ship to your local store where you went and bought it. And these ships aren't necessarily hitting the whales on purpose, but they don't even realize sometimes they're hitting these whales. And so by separating where the whales are and where the ships are, we're reducing that risk of this problem 
occurring further. So that's just a little bit of an introduction just to give you a sense of where it all began, how I started this adventure, and what I'm really doing right now. Um, and this is the first time anyone's done any work on these blue whales in this ocean. Um, I started the work on the ship strike because I was really concerned about it. So I've been pushing a lot of the work that's been happening. We're trying to change things at the level of the government so that we can protect these whales. And it's really my big, my big dream is to make sure that this problem can be solved. Um, over the next few years of my life. Um, so with that, you know, I'm going to turn over the floor to you guys. Maybe some of you will have some questions, or maybe some ideas, or maybe some just suggestions of what we can do as scientists. And I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your work. Um, I'm going to introduce the classrooms very briefly right now, um, and then we'll start going with a couple questions from each classroom, and we'll move our way through. So. Let's see. We have Mrs. Kendall's class. They're a third grade class from Weatherford, Texas. We've got Mr. Greenfield's grade fives from Freehold, New Jersey. Mrs. Hawkins Joe's, uh, they're from Sayreville, uh, New Jersey, and they're grade sixes. Mrs. Shaw is joining us from Barrie, Ontario, in Canada. She's got a grade five six. And then Mrs. Dwarf's joining us, grade eight, from Taylorville, Illinois. And then let me turn a microphone on. We had a classroom, a surprise classroom join us. Let's see where they're oh, from. Wow. Um, Adia, 0250. Where's your class from? Okay. Maybe they can't hear us. Fair enough. But we do have a bonus class. And Perfect. let's see, uh, viewers, we have several other classrooms joining, watching the live feed. So anybody who has questions, who's watching the live feed, if you send them into the event page, we'll keep an eye out for them and we'll make sure we get some of those in. So Mr. Greenfield in New Jersey, your mic's on. Hi, my name is Courtney. Hi. Do the blue whales swim and live in a pack or swim alone? That's a great question. So blue whales generally, they are solitary. So they kind of swim through the oceans on their own. And that's why when I saw them in this group, I was like, what's going on? They shouldn't be doing this. They have to be something, doing some kind of activity where they either need to have others right around them or it's just a really big hot spot. It's, it's kind of a lunchroom-like scenario. So it's rare to see them in these tight groups and aggregations. So they would probably feed, and then they go off and do their own thing. We'll see them maybe in pairs, but mostly as individuals. All right, great question. Let's grab another one. Hi, my name is Matthew. Hmm? What's some of the technology you use to know how big whales are? How big whales are? No, um, so, technology. Yeah, the, how te uh, what's the technology we use to see how big whales are? Yeah? Okay. So um, that's a good question. Actually, a lot of the data on the size of whales comes from um, strandings. So when they wash up on shore dead, we usually go out and measure. And because this has been happening... They, they strand up on beaches for different reasons. Either they get hit by ships and then they wash up on the beach or they can die of natural causes and then we go out and we usually use the most simple technology which is a measuring tape of some sort and we do our measurements and over time we've come up, we've been able to measure enough individuals to know that they grow to about um, 80 feet. The blue whales out in Sri Lanka will grow to about maximum of about 80 feet. All right, great questions. I'm going to turn on the mic of our grade eights in Illinois, see if they have a couple questions. Yeah, we do. Thank yep, you. Yep, they're Marcus. He's yeah. coming. Hello. Uh, TV set over there. Uh, uh, over here. Oh, that way, that TV set. Uh, <laughs> right there. Just look at the TV set. Look at the TV set. All right. All right, I got it. Okay. So why do uh, whales, like, go closer to land, not in the deep sea? So, okay, that's a great question. So, um, that's where we have to stop to understand the environment, okay? So, I'm trained as a marine biologist. I really like biology. I understand biology. But I suddenly started to realize that if I wanted to understand why an animal is behaving the way it is, I need to understand how the environment is influencing them, right? And that's one of the big things is that their they come close to land because of 
the influences of things like the, how the circulation moves and how the circulation interacts with the bottom of the seafloor and therefore makes areas of productive areas where there's like really big aggregations of food. So typically shallow waters are the continental slope where we go from you know shallow waters and then suddenly it starts to slope down into the very deep waters. That area is really great for what we, we have these things called upwellings where you have cold nutrient rich waters come up that sort of ridge and cold nutrient rich waters will come up to the surface, interact with the sunlight and you get these big proliferations of food and that's why generally you have these animals coming close to shore. They do go offshore too when they're doing their migrations or movements to other areas but they'll generally be feeding in areas that are on the continental slope. So I hope that helps answer that question. We have one more. Okay, perfect. Why is it so hard to make the companies move their boat routes? That's a really good question. So, um, it's pretty complicated because there's thousands of ships on the water and the so it's a multi-stage decision process, right? So. First of all, we can say, okay, whales are getting hit, but then people are like, okay, but where would you move the shipping lane if you wanted them not to get hit, right? So to be able to answer that question, we have to go out and do science. So we have to do a few years of science at least, so we have enough information to say, okay, we know that if we move shipping lanes from X to Y, we're going to not hit whales, we're going to have a, a much lower risk of hitting whales. So then we have the science, right? And then what happens is we have to go to the government of the country that this, this event is happening. So right now we work with the government of Sri Lanka and I go to the government and I say, look, we have this problem. Now we have the science saying this is where the shipping lanes have to be uh, moved. And we need to then, as a country, make an application to the International Maritime Organization, which is the big organization that governs all the shipping routes. So the shipping routes are essentially drawn on maps. Ships have to go on these pathways. Ships like using those pathways because it's economically very efficient for them. The shorter the route, the closer they go around our coastline, the shorter the route so they don't expend so much fuel and then it becomes cheaper for them. It's also the shorter route, the less time it takes. So for them, time-wise also, it's more beneficial. Um, so unless we have really good science and a really good case saying, there is a real need for you guys to expend a little bit more money on your fuel and in terms of time and go a little bit offshore. It's very hard to convince these companies to actually do anything. It's not that they don't want to, but they just have to have a really good reason to do it. Thank you. No problem. All right, great question. Uh, Mr. Hawken, or Mrs. Hawkins-Jones, your microphone is on in New Jersey. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sam, and one of the questions is, what is the most fascinating fact you discovered about blue whales? Ooh, you know, there's a lot of fascinating facts about blue whales. First of all, I thought the fact that their poop was red was extremely fascinating. Um, I mean, I don't know, did you guys see the bright red poop? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Did you not think it was really fascinating? It's like, who thought it can look that great? It's like... What it's waste <laughs> material, right? So that's fascinating. But there's a lot of things. So for example, you know, the blue whale's heart is the size of a small car. That's pretty awesome. Um, but they also they're the so they're the largest animal that's ever lived on the planet, and they've become so big by feeding on some of the smallest things. So they feed on these tiny shrimp-like creatures, which are maybe no bigger than your little finger, which is cool to think about because these little animals are that tiny, maybe like half an inch and these animals grow to you know 80 feet which I think is fascinating right and they're so big they have huge hearts but you know what if they if you gave them a loaf of bread they would choke because their esophagus their food pipe is so narrow that they can't actually eat anything bigger than krill and that's why they're feeding on these tiny creatures because that food pipe is so small that it restricts the size of things they can feed on so that's I think that's really fascinating it's such a giant animal you just assume that it can eat this massive things like at least a loaf of bread but even that's too much for this whale 
I think all of those things are fascinating. There's so much more about blue whales that makes them, to me, just remarkable creatures. Hi, my name is Hannah, and how are blue whales able to navigate long distances? You know, that's a, that's a really, it's probably the blue whale's best kept secret. It's really hard to know. We haven't still figured it out yet, so there's a lot of questions about are they following smells in the ocean? Um, are they using sound? I mean, how do they know to go hundreds of kilometers between, maybe not the population of blue whales in Sri Lanka, but you have the population of blue whales along the Californian coastline that do go to cold waters and then come back to warmer waters, or the ones in the Antarctic um, that go all the way up Western Australia into Indonesia and back. How do they know where they're going? So that's really a big mystery and we still haven't really figured it out. We don't even know how they find their food. So these are questions that, who knows, one of you may someday be able to answer. All right, great question. We're going to go in reverse and visit some classrooms again. So I can see in the front row uh, Mrs. Hawk and Joe's class more paper. So if you have one more, let's grab a question and we'll go back and visit Mr. Green. Sure. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Sydney and my question is, what is one of the biggest challenges you face in um, the study of blue whales? That's an awesome question. Um, I mean, all of you guys have some great questions coming on. This is my favorite part of every talk I do because I, it's nice to know what you guys are thinking too. Um, challenges plenty. So I come from a country where being a marine biologist is extremely unusual. It is an island, so to all of you maybe it seems obvious that people, there'd be lots of marine biologists, but there's probably two of us in the whole island, and it's not a small tiny island. Um, so first of all, convincing people that it was something that was an, actually a profession or a real job was difficult. When I told people I wanted to study to be a marine biologist, a lot of people asked me what I was going to do with my degree. They were like, so what are you going to do with it? And I was like, well, Sri Lanka is an island. There's a lot of ocean around. So it seems really obvious to go down this path. So then I come, come back, move back to Sri Lanka, and there's really no jobs lined up because nobody's a marine biologist. There's not a lot of marine science or marine conservation going on. And so then I had to really start from scratch. I had to build my own project, convince people that I could do it. And I'm also a woman in a country where um, it's quite male dominated. So then I had to convince everybody that as a woman I could still do everything that anyone else could do because that didn't stop me. So those are just some of the challenges. But what I love about challenges is they make you start to think really creatively. And I always believe the challenges are the things you can either climb over or go around. So I don't see them as blockades. I see them as opportunities to really think outside the box and um, try to figure out how to get around them. All right, great answer to a great question. Mr. Greenfield, your microphone's on. Hi, my name is Jorge. Uh, what, Hi. Uh, which, what animals are prey to the blue whale? Um, so, um, blue whales are baleen whales, so they have these comb-like structures in their mouth which they use to feed, and these combs are, like structures are actually made from the same material as your nails and hair, and so they actually don't have teeth, they can't bite, and so they really only feed on tiny things like tiny shrimp-like creatures called krill, that's pretty much what they feed on, and they're all very, very tiny, they're about the size of like half your little finger which is really cool. Okay, do you guys have another question? Here comes someone. Yeah, we got one coming. All right. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Justin. Is there anything smaller than krill that blue whales could eat and not choke on? Yeah, so sometimes they, um, so I'd say like 99% of what they feed on is krill. So the reason that they can feed, they're what, so here's a new t new fancy word for you. The word is stenophagus, right? So you're going to have to figure out how that's spelled by Googling it. But what that means is that they feed on only one species. So they're considered 
um, just krill feeders. So 99% of their diet is actually krill because they go in search of these extremely large krill swarms. So these, the advantage of eating things that are that small is that they hang out in really big tight groups. So with one big bite, the blue whale can take in actually quite a lot. So with each mouthful, they eat about 40 million of these krill, which is crazy if you think about it. And these balls of food are actually made up only of that species. So generally 99% of their diet is actually krill. There might be little pieces of like jellyfish that go in, but really that's not a significant part of what their, their diet. So I was just kind of thinking as, as you were talking about the food. I know mm -hmm. humpback whales use some strategies like making bubble kind of walls to herd the fish together. Is there so much krill that the blue whales don't really need to use any kind of strategy? Do they have any feeding strategies that are unique? Um, so I, you know, we, sometimes you see them surface skim feeding, so they'll sort of like go along the surface of the ocean with their mouths open, and you do see that in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, for example. They've documented skim feeding at the surface. Now out here in Sri Lanka, we don't really see feeding at the surface, so we think they have another strategy, but what they're doing is something much deeper, so we don't actually know what they're even doing. We just know that they're feeding in that area because we see the poop. Um, and then um, they have documented, for example, um, some there's scientists who have put these little critter cams, so little cameras on the backs of the head of a blue whale, and they've watched them. And what they do is they go through a krill patch and they s sort of pirouette through it. They corkscrew through it. Now we don't know if that's exclusively only found in California, or if that's something that you'll see in other parts of the world too. The coolest part about blue whales, I suppose one of the other facts that I think is really neat, is that they're the largest animal that's ever lived and we know pretty much nothing about them. So there's this whole mysterious world out there that we, you know, it'll take many lifetimes for us to even get close to figuring out what any of this means. All right, so jobs for the future in marine biology for exactly. sure. Exactly. Some of our students joining in. Um, let's just check in with our grade eights in Illinois, just see if there's any more questions that have popped up. We have another one. Perfect. Perfect. Anybody else have any other questions? You want one? All right, so she's going to need How big are blue whales whenever they're born? Oh, when they're born? That's a good question. So they're eight meters, which is, um, if you can murder that, that would be. I mean, they, they're probably about like 20, 25 feet, actually, when they're born. So the crazy thing is I work on these really tiny little fishing boats out here and my boats are maybe maximum of 21 feet and then we've seen a couple of newborns and they're bigger than my boat. And so that's like real perspective for you because you're like, oh, it's just a baby. But if you're the baby of a giant, then the baby is also going to be a giant. Thank you. I think we have one. Okay. She's coming. Um, hi. <laughs> hi. Talk loud. Um, so do the blue whale, do they have any enemies or do they have any strategies they use to ward off them? So, you know, that's, that's a, what's really interesting about that question is, if you think about blue whales, they're the largest animals that have lived in the oceans, right? So they actually don't have natural predators per se. Um, killer whales may go after their calves, but not really because blue whales are pretty big and hefty and can usually ward off anything. Their only real predator now, or their only big enemy right now, is humans. So all our activities are the things that actually destroy these populations. Um, sort of like all the nets that are floating in the ocean that they get entangled with, the ships that they get struck by in the past, that they were, they were actually hunted for their meat. For a long time, nobody could hunt them because they're really fast and they're really you know, agile until a human being came up with this technology that could basically outrun the whales and you know, shoot a deck-mounted sort of a harpoon into the whale. So really, their only enemies are us, so to speak. All right, great questions. Ah, uh, let's give last question to Mrs. Hawkinjoe's group, see if someone in the front row has another question. 
Hi, my name is Carolyn, and Hello. my question is, what are some adaptations that blue whales have had to make over time, especially in your waters? Okay, so that's interesting. So one of the things is that they speak a different language. Um, so that's an adaptation to living in a smaller community where you just have to be able to talk to the people around you. Um, they, uh, so they lift their tail flukes up before a deep dive more often than anywhere else. Um, this could be an adaptation to uh, sort of finding their prey patches which might be deeper in the ocean. Um, so they have to sort of make themselves into like a torpedo shape for them to be able to go down deeper. Um, so I would say that was that's a sort of another adaptation they have. Um, you know, there's probably a whole lot more that we haven't discovered, um, which makes it very interesting. It, you know, basically these whales are a good lifetime job for someone like me because there's so much more to learn, and it's a job for so many other people in the future. So who knows? All right. Well, Asha, thank you so much for... Um, having this hangout with us today. I know um, here for most of us, it's uh, our morning's just getting started, but uh, uh -huh. must be getting close to, must be after 9 there, 9, 9.30ish, 9.48? Yeah, it's about yeah. 9, it's about 9.20, so oh. um, it's getting close to bedtime. <laughs> well, thank you so much for showing us a world that, you know, I don't think many students had, um, had even thought about before, that, um, you know, the Sri Lankan waters, um, not only are they beautiful, but they're this amazing um, feeding ground for these giants of our planet. So thank you so much for opening that up to us today. No problem. Thank you to everyone for joining. I really appreciate you know your attention and your time and all your questions. They're fabulous. Keep thinking of more questions. And you can always find me somewhere on the internet if you ever have more. So please feel free to reach out. All right. Well, we're going to turn the mic on so the classrooms can say uh, a goodbye and thank you, and then uh, we'll go off air. So okay, here we perfect. go. Turning the mics on so we can say goodbye. Bye. All right. I hope you weren't knocked off your chair by that. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining in. And uh, we're signing off for today. Thanks, everybody.